Hello and welcome to this talk about some different snow travel methods for mountaineering. I'm going to talk about some of the different variables that are involved with um, using mountaineering specific boots with some of the different alpine touring options with snowshoes and split boards and kind of go through so that you get some general information about the uh, advantages and disadvantages of some of these different types of uh, equipment for getting around in the mountains. So I'm going to start out talking about mountaineering skis in a traditional sense where you're using a mountaineering style uh, plas double plastic mountaineering boot on a uh, set of skis um, to get around in the mountains. So just to start out when we're looking at mountaineering skis generally speaking we're looking at a uh, a little bit shorter downhill style ski. Generally, we look for lightweight skis, telemark skis, alpine touring skis, something like that. Um, we, we don't want them to be the super fat ones generally because we can't power a ski like that with a, a traditional mountaineering boot. So we're looking for something that's reasonably soft flexing um, and pretty lightweight. We're also generally not looking for a super nice ski. We're not going out and buying thousand dollar super carbon fiber skis uh, for the most part because we know we're going to take them out onto glaciers on moraines, run over rocks, walk across stream beds, things like that. Things where we pretty much beat up the skis and so we're looking for something um, uh, and, and more specifically something in that 70 to maybe up to 100 millimeter waist width um, uh, generally works uh, pretty well for this type of ski. Uh, another thing that we're considering uh, when we're thinking about a uh, uh, mountaineering ski is, is this ski only being used for approaches? If so, there are people who really enjoy um, a very wide, short cross-country ski, like the one on, that you can see here on the left side of the screen. Um, and these even have a waxless scale pattern to them, which allow you to travel through the moraines and the flatter parts of the glacier without even putting your climbing skins on. Makes transportation a little better. The dilemma with these is that they don't, they have very little downhill ski performance. They don't reverse camber very well so that you can be, you can become really frustrated trying to downhill ski with these. We're using a lot of snow plow and survival ski techniques. Um, uh, more so than uh, you would with a traditional down, lightweight downhill ski. As far as boots go, these are a couple examples of boots. Um, a stiff sole double mountaineering boot is generally used in Alaska, one where we can pull the liner out. There are times when we're using single boots or insulated single boots for spring conditions, you know, warmer conditions and whatnot, but just in terms of general use, we're using uh, boots uh, like these two seen here. Um, one of the things that's really important to realize about mountaineering boots is that they don't have nearly as much support, especially in the backward direction, as a um, downhill ski boot or alpine touring boot are going to have. And so they have very limited downhill ski ability takes a long time to be proficient enough and balanced enough skiing downhill to really have an enjoyable experience on a, on a mountaineering boot um, for, for, for most people. Um, the other thing, and I'll talk about this as we get into the bindings that's really important about a mountaineering boot specifically, is this dimension right here, here called the heel height. And you can see this is about a 32 millimeter heel height. This is about a 40 millimeter heel height. The reason that's important is because um, there's a standard heel height for alpine touring and downhill boots that's exactly 30 millimeters. And if we're outside of that dimension, we need to take extra considerations for which bindings we choose and how they're gonna fit into those bindings. It used to be that the binding choice was fairly simple for putting a mountaineering boot onto a ski 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, people would consistently go towards bindings like this Silveretta binding here or bindings like the Raymer bindings or some of those other ones that have existed in the past. Quite honestly, no one currently is making a boot 
that has an adjustable heel height to it. In other words, that can accommodate a 40 millimeter uh, 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 heel height. Almost all the boots or almost all the bindings made are made for that 30 millimeter heel height. That's the standard with uh, Alpine Touring boots. And so something like the Fricci free rides on the right hand side of this slide is going to have a fixed heel height and it's going to make it difficult to fit certain mountaineering boots in there. So that's really the key. Um, there are some mountaineering boots that are made at 30 millimeters or close to 30 millimeters. Something like the um, uh, Koflach uh, Arctic x here or um, the La Sportiva Barunce boot is made at about a 33 millimeter heel height. Um, and I've modified mine a little bit. I've, I've shaved them down a little bit. So with those Fricci free ride bindings, that framed Alpine Touring binding with an adjustable toe height for the Alpine Touring, I can fit my uh, plastic double mountaineering boots, my single leather boots, I can fit my Alpine Touring boots, and I can fit my traditional downhill boots all into that binding. But when I do put my specific mountaineering boots in there, they don't fit perfect and it's definitely not uh, the manufacturer's intent when they built those bindings to fit something that wasn't built to that DIN standard 30 millimeter and the correct shape, um, but, but it can be functional. Your other option is to search out um, one of these older bindings like the Silveretta. Um, in this picture, it's the Silveretta 500. There's a Silveretta 404s, the 400s, basically all those bindings that were designed and built anywhere from 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago um, that people have in their garage, people have on eBay, whatever, and you can sometimes find those older bindings. Um, one of the other variables with the older Alpine um, touring bindings like these Silverettas is they sit a lot lower to the ski and there are some people especially when they're used primarily for approaches and cross-country skiing and not for going downhill that like their boot to be closer to the ski versus something like this Fricci binding on the right here the ski the boot sits up off the ski a little bit and changes the leverage and makes it a little harder to balance on when you're going cross country or you're skiing in 10 miles to approach your mountaineering objective. Most people who use this type of setup um, would ski in, use this as an approach ski for ice climbing, for mountaineering, for alpine climbing, leave their skis at the bottom, put on their crampons, do their technical ascent, and then come back and use their skis to get back to camp they're not using these necessarily for any sort of a fun descent or technical descent, um, uh, unlike the next skis that I'll talk about. Just to kind of segue in here to this different style of skis, there's a lot of terms that are thrown around for this type of ski. So um, the most common term right now being used are backcountry skis. Um, uh, another term that describes exactly the same thing is alpine touring skis, AT skis, ski mountaineering skis, randonnée skis. Some people even call them uphill skis. All of these refer to the same thing. But then within that type of skis, there are different categories. And some people um, uh, break them down into kind of a four category system. So they'll break all the alpine touring or all the backcountry skis into race ones, speed, tour, and free. And during this presentation, when I'm talking specifically about uh, mountaineering, uh, mountaineering uh, transportation in the mountains, I'm going to focus on speed and tour. Race and free are sort of fringes of the mountaineering community. Race would be rondo racing, uphill racing, um, that type of thing where people are sprinting up as fast as they can and skiing down and their boots are, are spe very specialized. Or on the other end, the free end are mostly side country, back country skiers. So they're people who might be riding lifts up, but then going out of bounds. Their equipment is heavy and it's really used in resort a lot or in that resort type uh, skiing, hucking cliffs, um, free riding in the backcountry uh, and those type of things. So those are kind of uh, on the fringes on the outside, 
really I'm gonna talk about the two categories that ski mountaineers use, a lightweight ski mountaineering setup that would be kind of in that speed category, and then the heavier weight ski mountaineering type setup, which might be more in that tour category. So when we're talking about the skis for lightweight ski mountaineering care or lightweight alpine touring or speed category alpine touring, um, some of the things we're looking for is we're looking for a ski that um, typically is built with some carbon fiber with a lightweight wood core um, and, and really excels at skiing downhill, skiing through powder, but not necessarily um, skiing at super fast speeds on really hard terrain. They don't hold an edge as well as, as some of the higher end downhill specific skis, but they're really versatile and they make going uphill a ton easier because the skis are that much lighter. Um, in terms of dimensions, most uh, lightweight ski mountaineering skis are kind of in that, uh, um, you know, that 80 to maybe 105 millimeters underfoot as far as the dimensions go. I sort of tend towards like the 95, 100 range for myself, for my own personal use. We're looking at skis that, um, uh, you know, maybe have a little bit of rocker to them in front as far as their, the way they're constructed, but we're not necessarily looking at a ski that has like a full rocker and is 130 underfoot and whatnot, partially just to save weight into in this category and make it easier to travel in the mountains and go uphill, but partially because maybe we're not matching it with a binding and a boot, which I'll talk about here, um, that would support those kind of uh, things in the ski. So these are a couple examples of some lightweight uh, ski mountaineering boots that are in that speed category. They provide um, good solid downhill ski performance, not peak performance, but good solid performance. They've got good range of motion when you're in tour mode. Um, they perform fairly well um, climbing ice or climbing um, up steep snow. The thing that you give up when you switch from a mountaineering boot to an alpine touring boot is some of the flexion, some of the sideways flexion you get out of the cuffs and some of the other flexion that's important in being efficient for both uh, uh, ice climbing or for steep snow climbing. Um, you do give up some uh, efficiency and basically a lot of times with alpine touring boots up snow slopes you'll end up just front pointing up the whole way instead of using some of the alternate techniques like French technique with sideways, things like that, which tends to put a little more stress on your body. Um, but the, the advantage to that, to the speed category is the boots are almost as lightweight as most of those double plastic mountaineering boots. So you're not giving up a ton in weight and you gain so much in terms of your ability to ski down that one of the reasons they've stopped making some of the old school bindings for mountaineering, putting mountaineering boots onto skis is that many people have switched to one of these speed category, lightweight uh, ski mountaineering setups um, when they do uh, general snow mountaineering in the mountains because they so much enjoy that downhill performance that you're getting out of this type of equipment. Um, a couple other little variables just to is that crampons don't tend to fit quite as well, especially if you have a boot like the one on the right here that has gotten rid of the um, more traditional toe shape uh, of a downhill boot. Um, it's You have to use a different style of semi-automatic crampons or something like that to allow this boot to effectively use a crampon for uh, whether that's snow climbing or ice climbing. They also traditionally haven't been as warm as some of the mountaineering boots. So some of the high altitude mountaineering, whether it's Denali or whatnot, would stick with the um, uh, more traditionally stick with a double plastic mountaineering boot. Um, but they've made strides and some of the boots that use the name brand intuition liners like the Scarpa boots here um, start to get into the similar realm of warmth as um, uh, the traditional mountaineering boots. And in some cases, people are using things like uh, mountaineering over boots to go over the boots if they are 
pushing the elevation up or pushing the temperatures um, uh, for their climbing expeditions. So in this speed category, there's been a huge um, uh, balloon of different choices that you have for bindings. But generally speaking, in the speed category, most people are using tech bindings, which is a generic term for the type of binding that goes into a pin system, which is inset into, into your alpine touring boot, and then a pin system which hooks into the heel of the boot. And you can see it here in this one example of a tech binding, lightweight tech binding. These have some upsides and downsides. They cut the weight way down. They're, they weigh, a lot of them will weigh about two pounds per pair versus four to four pounds or more per pair for uh, a framed binding like the ones I showed you to, that you might put the mountaineering uh, boots onto a ski. Um, or a different frame to binding. The negatives to these is they do tend to be a little more finicky. Some don't have ski brakes on them, so you run into the dilemma of do I use a leash? When do I take the leash off when I'm in avalanche terrain? Do I just skip it and let my ski run away? So some of these lighter weight ones don't have ski brakes, which you have to sort of negotiate. And then they don't release as consistently as a traditional downhill binding. And so you do have to keep that in mind as well, based on your level of aggressiveness on your skis, your comfort level, um, and, and uh, risk tolerance for things like a, a, you know, a knee injury or torn ACL. Um, they've gotten way better over the years. But, and then the final thing about these is they do tend to lack some of the durability that can exist um, in either the heavier duty tech bindings, which I'll talk to in a minute when I get more into that tour um, category of alpine touring, or, um, or a traditional downhill type binding. So sometimes when I'm thinking about these different categories of alpine touring skis, I think about what the goal is for the trip. So there are people who go out and climb and their goal is to get far back in the mountains, to climb cool peaks, and to use their skis to descend, maybe, um, maybe not, depending on the conditions and whatnot. And then there are people who go out to the mountains with the goal of climbing up so they can ski down. The skiing down is really the reward or the goal for the trip. And so these people would tend to focus more on the performance of their ski equipment um, and less on the fact that they suffer more because it's heavier or maybe on the way up or the way into whatever they're going to do. So this would be the tour category of alpine tour skiing. Um, still totally appropriate for getting out and climbing mountains, but um, gives you a little uh, a more oomph and more uh, security and ski skiability on whatever descent it's, you make. So this takes the skis into a little different category in general. People are using skis that are generally wider. So this category would be more that 90 millimeter waist widths up to 130 millimeter waist width. Generally speaking, people are running skis that are a little longer, where I might run a 172, 174, 176 in, in that lightweight, lighter weight category of skis. Um, uh, speed category. I might run, you know, up into the low 180s in, a, in more of this uh, uh, free, uh, or sorry, tour category of ski, of alpine touring skis. Something that gives me a little extra flotation, a little extra stability. Um, we might look at skis that have a little bit more early rise or even some rocker, which makes the ski engage in turns more effectively. Um, it might not hold an edge quite as solidly, but many of the skis in this category also might have like a lightweight um, titanium top sheet on them, uh, which is a metal top sheet, which gives some extra stability torsionally um, and uh, stiffer flex to them. Might have a little less carbon fiber, you know, so to, and that will affect the pricing of these skis a bit, maybe making them a teeny bit lower. Um, but those are some characteristics that people are looking for in this category, tour category, who are really interested in the, the uh, feel of the ski for that descent. So as we look at bindings for this category, we have some of the um, 
fancier, uh, better releasing, heavier, tougher tech bindings. Um, we've got um, king pins and we have um, a variety of, of brands that make this category. They're easier to get into generally than some of the lighter weight uh, tech bindings, but they, um, they can up to double the, the weight that you're carrying on your feet at all times when you're out on your skis. Uh, but people who, who gravitate towards this category are really more interested in the skiing and they're willing to work a little harder. The other type of binding that uh, people use in this category would be more of a frame binding, like the free chief free ride on the left. This allows a more traditional step in, a more traditional uh, uh, release system, and feels more comfortable like a, a downhill ski binding. But the heel still releases and gives you climbing bars and things like that. And again, the, the big sacrifice um, looking in this category of bindings is weight, but the advantages are skiability and um, release consistency in the binding. So as with the skis and the bindings, again, we're, we're looking more at the performance. These, these boots, uh, the more performance-oriented Alpine Touring uh, boots will have, still have the flexibility fore and aft, but they'll have a stiffer flex to them. Sometimes they're a little higher. Uh, a lot of times you'll see uh, more of like a four buckle construction similar to a high-end downhill boot versus like a two buckle or three buckle construction on a lot of the uh, lighter weight Alpine Turing boots. Uh, so these boots provide that um, feeling of a true downhill boot um, to the backcountry. A lot of these will still have a thermal adjustable liner that's fairly warm um, and, and comfortable in the backcountry. Um, and the boots sometimes have a little bit less rocker, meaning the sole is flatter on the bottom to, to give you a more consistent release, which will make walking, walking on rocks, hiking in, things like that, sometimes a little bit trickier with these. And a lot of times a boot like this can gain something like two pounds a pair by going with that higher end, higher performance boot, which isn't that big a deal, but over time, two extra pounds in your binding, two extra pounds in your boots, and you start to add up to a, a significantly heavier setup that's just more work to get into the backcountry with and to get up the mountain with. So this is just a quick weight comparison between some of those different options. So we've got our light, lighter weight um, uh, uh, ski mountaineering setup here and you know the whole thing when we put a fairly light uh, ski 95 waist width with a decently light boot and a, a, a lighter weight tech binding that does have a break to it we're coming out you know in that 13 pound range there are some ski mountaineers who go in fast and light who might be down closer to a 10 pound total weight for their whole package so it is possible to go even lighter than this but this is a pretty functional ski setup but you can see as we as we go down the list here into a more of a traditional um, mountaineering ski setup where we're using an inverno double plastic mountaineering boot we're using a uh, silveretta 500 binding and just a lightweight kind of uh, all-around tele alpine touring ski we actually have gained a couple pounds over the um, uh, lightweight Alpine Turing setup. We've lost a ton of ski ability. We have gained some climbing ability, but a lot of the weight realistically comes in the binding. Silveretta versus the tech binding is a huge weight difference between those two different setups. And that's where you gain those two pounds here. And then you go into more of that performance AT setup and there's a fine line between the side country free and the tour setups. But basically what I'm showing here is that you're gaining, you know, anywhere from four to seven pounds in your ski setup um, that's on your feet at all times. If you're if you're transferring from that lightweight ski mountaineering to that uh, more tour or free oriented uh, performance alpine touring setup. But you do gain that ski performance. Um, and, and the other thing that some people really enjoy about 
that, that more performance oriented uh, Alpine Touring setup is that they use it um, for all their days when they resort ski as well. So it's kind of a multi-function thing. They're not buying something just for the purpose of ski mountaineering. They're buying a ski setup that works for their, you know, 40 days of resort skiing a year and their 15 days of mountain climbing a year or whatever that might look like for, for a various climber. So another option for getting out in the mountains um, is a Telemark setup. And when I first started ski mountaineering, most people I knew who ski descent, who did ski descents in the mountains um, were Telemark skiers. They could take their skills that they had developed in, in a resort or in the mountains and use them to tour in, to climb up and to ski down a, a slope. Whereas most of the people I knew weren't using double plastic mountaineering boots for um, significant ski descents anyways. And there are exceptions to that. But as time went on, the Telemark equipment got closer and closer to Alpine Touring stuff. And, and many folks these days who were in that Telemark world in the backcountry have locked their heels down and are um, have moved into more of that Alpine Touring category. So I think these have their place. It's a beautiful technique when done right. Uh, but most people, it's not the most practical for Alpine Touring. The old duck build toes, like the ones that are on here, um, and the flex that comes in the boots are not overly effective for, e for any kind of climbing due to the fact that you lose efficiency when your boot flexes. Um, the, toe, the, the duck bill toe on those blocks, your, the potentially blocks the toe points of your crampons from going in. And technology has transferred where they've gotten rid of that three pin toe for some of the more modern Telemark stuff. They've gotten better releases. They, they've really made strides, but um, a lot of, it just seems to be moving closer and closer to that Alpine Touring. So um, many people I know have used that for the ski mountaineering um, and maybe work on some Telemark stuff when they ski resort to enjoy that form of turn or whatever. Um, either another form of mountaineering travel, which has exploded over the last 15 years, uh, are people who want to take their their snowboarding skills or their snowboarding into the mountains use it to transport in use it to climb up the uh, slope and then put their snowboard together and use it for a, a rip in snowboard descent and so there are now many different choices for split boards um, and many different choices for um, uh, what you put onto a split board um, I've seen people put uh, traditional plastic mountaineering boots onto a split board with an old um, a plate binding that was used for um, when people were using rigid boots on snowboards for carving. I've seen people put um, uh, alpine touring boots onto snowboards um, for the warmth, the flexibility, the stiffness when climbing. And I also know snowboarders who do some climbing with soft snowboard boots. Um, again, you run into similar limitations as Telemark boots. You, you need a strap-on style crampon for a soft snowboard boot, um, and you lose efficiency and toe pointing, your boot flexes, and, and they just aren't as efficient for climbing. And so um, really, it, people who are willing to do that want that exact feeling for their descent of those soft boots. And so that's really important to, to think about when you go down the, the split board route. The other thing here in Alaska, we do a lot of approaches on glaciers, which means a slow gradual climb up and down over moraine, up a glacier. And many times we might travel four, six, 10 miles in to get to our objective. Um, generally speaking, the way in on a split board, you're just touring along with a skin on uh, similar to uh, an Alpine touring setup. And, and you're not that much slower. But the time when the split board, the people on the split boards generally suffer is the rolling, fairly low angle um, uh, descents from after the approach. And so you basically have gone in 10 miles and now you have to come out 10 miles, which means you basically have to keep your split board in ski mode, ski downhill, 
um, down the glacier, across, side hill, rocks, all the obstacles that are out there um, uh, on a split board. And, and it can be really difficult to, to descend in that way. So there are some significant limitations on long uh, approaches and, and long skis out on some of the glaciers that we have here. Generally speaking, I feel like split boards work better for um, uh, when you can get closer to your um, actual ascent and then uh, just tour up that and then use your snowboard to descend. But if there are long approaches, many of the split boarders, I know people who've gotten into the mountains using split boards um, have switched to skis when any kind of an approach, um, uh, an approach of any distance really comes into play. So during the splitboard uh, presentation and uh, some of the other parts, I mentioned climbing skins. Climbing skins are an integral part of any of the setups I've talked about, whether that's a mountaineering ski setup, whether that's a lightweight alpine touring, whether that's a, a more of a performance alpine touring setup, whether that's a splitboard setup. Climbing skins are what allow us to climb up slopes. Um, a cross-country ski has limitations. It can climb up slopes up to a certain point and then it starts slipping. And so if you get onto a 10 degree slope or a, a approximately that, your ski starts slipping backwards. And so um, the way that these skis work is that these removable directional hair climbing skins um, typically hook on the tip and they typically hook on the tail and they have a removable adhesive on the bottom. And you stick these to the bottom of your skis or your split board and these are what allow you to climb up. And they allow you to climb up an amazingly steep slope. You can climb up basically straight up a 20 degree slope, maybe up to a, you know, getting close to a 25 degree slope depending on the snow conditions. And um, they work really well for that ascent. Now that said with climbing skins, climbing skins are also a huge pain in the butt. Um, they, the directional hairs on them are, are, can become iced up. So they're typically either little nylon hairs or little mohair, which is a natural fiber. And basically each of those pieces of material is, uh, has some durable waterproof uh, finish that's put onto them. But over time, as you go across ice and rocks and whatnot, that durable waterproof finish comes off. And then the, the nylon skin or the mohair skin will actually absorb water into the fiber. And then as you go into colder, drier snow higher up, they will ice up. And so um, having some equipment to take care of that, a scraper, maybe some skin, skin wax, which is a rub-on product that re-waterproofs those hairs, can be super important as far as that goes. The other problem with skins is that the adhesive they use, um, when it's new, typically works pretty well, but it really doesn't work well when it's cold and when it's wet. And when we're out in the mountains, the mountain environment is both cold and wet. So we need to take extra precautions and do things like wipe all the snow off the, our skis before we put the skins on. We need to keep the skins warm. Um, whether it's during our descent or possibly at night on a multi-day mountaineering trip, we need to make sure that the adhesive is going to continue to work. Um, if it gets wet, we need to find ways to dry it out by putting it inside our clothing system or some such thing, putting it out in the sunshine when we have that as part of our seasonal um, uh, mountaineering um, to make sure that that skin uh, uh, adhesive, the skin glue, continues to function. The other thing about climbing skins is it's nice to have a backup system. So my backup system are ski straps and duct tape. And I use those two methods if my skin is wet, I don't have the time or the, re you know, the uh, a way to dry it out effectively. And my basically my skin is coming off when I need it to function when I'm climbing up. Um, holding it on with skin straps or with duct tape can be an effective way to, to manage that. So those are part of my emergency skin kit is I'm going to have a scraper, skin wax, ski straps, and duct tape is all brought along as part of my making sure I can get my skins to work because they're a, a critical part of making sure your ski mountaineering setup, whichever one you choose, 
um, remains functional when you're out in the mountains. The last form of snow transportation I'm not going to focus a ton on is snowshoes. They're functional for an approach. Obviously, you'd be going into it the mindset of um, switching to crampons when you got to the climb, using them to go in, using them to come out. Um, the, the big dilemma with snowshoes is that, um, let's say you're with a group, one person has snowshoes and one person has a mountaineering ski. You could stay together as far as getting into your camp. Let's say you're approaching six miles getting into camp. Um, the person on snowshoes might be a little behind or a little slower um, on the approach, uh, but overall you'd be in the same universe as far as getting to where you want to go. The dilemma comes when it's time to turn around and ski out that glacier that six miles. Um, where a person, a competent skier on skis, might be able to pull their skins and slide out and they might be back to the car in an hour, the person on snowshoes is going to take almost just as long to go out as they did in. So if it was a four hour approach, it might be a four hour um, de uh, descent or uh, to get back to the car on the way out. So that doesn't work as far as combining uh, skiing and snowshoeing on the same trip really can, can cause frustrations and, and problems. If everyone's committed to snowshoes, great. If everyone's committed to skis, great. But mixing them on, on mountaineering uh, trips or expeditions generally isn't uh, the best plan. So a lot of the equipment I talked about is very expensive and it's a good idea to figure out what you want before you buy it. It's not real for most people to own multiples of these different types of ski, ski mountaineering snow travel uh, methods. And so people need to sort of figure out where they're at. Overall, the, the most versatile type of equipment would be something in that ski uh, speed, lightweight alpine touring category. And um, that seems to sort of cover most of the bases for most people. You know, if you know you're an expeditionary mountaineer and your long-term goal is to climb Denali and you're not much of a skier or your long-term goal is to climb steep technical alpine routes where skis don't really have a part, then the, the mountaineering type skis with the Silveretta, maybe the cross-country, backcountry ski might be for you. And if you know you're going to spend a lot of days in resort and the skiing is all you're about, the performance stuff. But for the rest of us, the speed series, lightweight uh, alpine touring stuff really covers a lot of our bases. And I've written up a little uh, write up about some more uh, specifics about that category when you're ready to go out and start looking and buying. Um, and so if you click this link here or, or go to this link, you'll be able to get some extra information. Thank you for uh, checking out this uh, information about getting out and doing some ski mountaineering um, and how the, what equipment might work best for you. Um, hopefully you have a great time out there and uh, really enjoy being out in the mountains. Thanks.